Hello and welcome to Money Life. This is Jeeta Dilal. What are we discussing today? Vikshit Bharat, but not the budget because that was just a vote on account. What I'm talking about is when we say Vikshit Bharat or a modern India, we need to change a lot of things. Something that affects you and me, which is outdated transmission systems, the need for a probate, threats of coercive action if you don't have a nominee. All this has to go because this is a generation which has their own hard-earned money, which they want to decide what to do with, and we have a freedom of choice. Take a look at how things work in India. Now, all of us know that the death of a loved one is a very painful experience. In India, it is made even more painful because of the confusion around transmission of assets. The process often is so harrowing, the family is grieving, they also sometimes have lost a bread earner. They need to get money to be able to continue life. In fact, that itself is often on threat, in threat, but they are hassled to access bank accounts, to be able to get access to mutual funds. And the stories are frankly unnerving. Take a look at what happens. So on one hand, you have technology. So you have Aadhaar, one identity. We're talking about tremendous economic growth. It has led to work-related migration. It's not just labor that has moved across the country. In fact, people in the IT industry are all over. They go from north to south, go abroad, come back to India. And yet, imagine the systems that they're dealing with. They are still backward. I'm not saying things are not changing, but every time it's a lot of pressure for every little change to happen. Lots of challenges and constantly knocking on doors. This should not happen in Vikshit Bharat, right? We have no standard operating procedures for most things. And multiple processes, the Investor Education and Protection Fund under the Ministry of Corporate Affairs is the oldest, which is dealing with the online system. Ask anybody and they will tell you that most times, unless you use an agent who knows how to work the system and charges anywhere from 10 to 30% of what is due to you, you cannot get your money. These are shares, debentures, corporate benefits that have not been claimed for seven years. Sometimes the person who owns them is still alive and has forgotten about it. But most often, it is the heirs of a deceased person who are trying to access it. The Reserve Bank of India has set up a portal. Again, with a lot of pushing, from people like us at Money Life Foundation. It has created this portal to trace unclaimed bank deposits, but the response is mixed about the ease of use. It's called Udgam. I've done, I've talked about this before in previous video blogs. The Securities and Exchange Board of India, the market regulator, I must say to its credit, has done much more than the other regulators. It issued a master circular in May 2023 which built on a process that it had already initiated the previous year for easing the pain of transmission and has a comprehensive list of things that people can do, a detailed SOP, and all of it is aimed at simplification. But it's not all hunky-dory. Let me come to that later. The big issue I want to tackle in this blog is about probate. Now, if those of you who have never had to deal with wills and inheritance probably don't even know what it is. What it means is that after you make a will, this will has to get the seal of approval of a court, not all over India, only Mumbai and Calcutta. Why these towns as they were at that time is because they were called British presidency towns. They are not the big metropolises that you have today. Only in these three cities, within the municipal limits, you have to get the seal of approval. Now, is this certification easy? First of all, it involves a fat court fee. And if even if the will is uncontested, there are two or three heirs or sometimes one, there is no dispute whatsoever. Even then, this is mandatory. Why this inequality for people in just three cities? Believe it or not, because we still follow the Indian Succession Act, which dates back to 1925. It's a British law that has remained unchecked, changed 76 years after independence. We have overall 
the Indian Penal Code. We have given it an Indian name. We are all very proud of it. Passed through Parliament without opposition because opposition MPs were out. That was 150 years old, so we changed it. This is also 1925, but because it doesn't affect many people, who cares? After all, people affected are in three cities. We've even got a one nation, one tax in GST. But this law hasn't changed. Just three cities. Keep remembering that. Now, you have to pay a court fee for the court to give its certification. Then you can't do it on your own. So you need a lawyer. So you have to pay legal fees. The time taken is a minimum of eight to 10 months. Even if everything is OK, there's no contest. If there is a problem, it can go to two, three, five years, whatever. The fee in Mumbai is capped at 75,000. Now, the caps are important because in most cases, people don't make a will unless they have substantial amounts to leave. So almost everyone is paying the cap. So Mumbai, 75,000. In Calcutta, it's capped at 50,000. And in Delhi, it's a percentage, but basically capped at 30,000 because the percentage don't matter. Everybody is above the cap of five lakhs. Otherwise, you don't bother to make a will. Why haven't people pushed to drop this? Answer is simple. Or rather, it's threefold. One, most of us as individuals go through this harrowing process only once or twice in our life. So having gone through it, we don't want another fight to say, oh, stop probates. We expect somebody like an NGO or a Money Life Foundation to do the fighting. Second, legal professionals are not interested. They earn a fee. They don't mind what happens because it's a professional income for them. And third, which is important, that until after economic liberalization, in fact, until the last 20, 23 years ago, most people did not have substantial own earned income. A lot of times they were getting a flat from their parents, ancestral homes, property, which is in a Hindu undivided family, whatever. So it used to go by the Succession Act of each community, religion, Parsis have one, Muslims, you know, different communities have different ones, the Sikhs have their own. So it went, the Christians and Catholics have their own. So it goes by your religion. Now, the past two decades, people are earning a lot more. In fact, most people will probably tell you that their children and grandchildren are earning far more than they earned at the time they retired, right? Which means that they have multiple homes, sometimes in multiple cities, sometimes in multiple spouses because they've got married and divorced, and the children, it's all complicated. And they have begun to leave a will. Indians did not like to leave a will. Some even had superstitions about it. Now people write their will. If you have not done it, please do it. It's important, especially if you have property and you want to be clear who you want to leave it, leave it to and in what proportion. So let's look at what the regulators have done. So I've told you probate. The Law Commission once talked about making changes in 2015. Nothing has happened. Like I said, nothing happens until you push for it. Now, regulators. SEBI has done a lot, but all of a sudden it's got one rule which says that Anybody who does not have a nominee listed will have their shares frozen. This was said in 2022. First, let's look at the positives. It's simplified the process. It's got detailed SOPs. It, in October 2023, it even talked about introducing a central mechanism for reporting death. There are clear guidelines how it is supposed to be reported and everybody is supposed to have access to it. Companies, registrars, transfer agents, mutual funds, depositories, depository participants, and exchanges. It got applicable now on the 1st of Jan 2024. Let's see how going forward, whether this is working. In fact, if some of you have experienced it in the last, what, one month, please tell us. Under this process, once a death is reported, all transactions in this account are put on hold, which means that nobody can create mischief. The DP or the broker can't run away with your shares. It remains on hold until you have completed the transmission processes, produced a succession certificate or a will, and done your documentation, and the assets are transferred. In 2021, one part that SEBI did, according to me, maybe my personal opinion, is controversial. It stipulated that trading and DMAT accounts, which did not have a nominee declared, would be frozen. Not only that, you have to submit KYC details for the nominee. 
it is frankly unclear what right the regulator has to freeze my self-earned assets without my consent. But circular was issued and the deadline has been repeatedly postponed. But the threat was enough. Most people have fallen in line. Now, what we have done is, most of you know, we have a sister organization called Money Life Foundation. It's a not-for-profit organization. We are conducting a survey on transmission processes to get feedback. Because I, like I said earlier, if you don't push for change, change does not happen. Now, 1,100 people have uh, filled this survey, and we discover that 90% of them have listed their nominees, most of them out of fear. Another 10% intend to do it. Out of this 10%, I should say, 1% is very clear that do not plan to list a nominee. I don't know whether they're going to fight SEBI's coercive action if it is. It goes ahead and freezes their account, but they've said they won't do it. They are within their rights to do it. Now, mutual funds in 20, June 2022, again under SEBI rule, have gone a step further, a little more sensible. You either have a nominee or you specifically opt out with a formal declaration. So I'm assuming this 1% has made a formal declaration if they are mutual fund investors. Nominations indeed are useful. They help the money, a nominee holds assets in trust. A will finally decides who should get it. But a nominee at least gets access to money. So if it's a bank account, if the wife is a nominee, the husband has passed away, she has access to the money. If there are young children, she can take care of it. If the will has said she's not going to get all that money, then it has to be given by the nominee. This is something that you have to understand. So it's important that the nomination process works smoothly if a transmission has to take place. The Reserve Bank of India has delegated the responsibility. It doesn't want to be involved. So it has asked Indian Banks Association to put in place SOPs, which it did in 2016. Nobody follows them. There is no penalty for not following. So each bank manager either follows it, in which case you're lucky. And if they decide to decide to have all kinds of rules that they make up on the spur of the moment, you suffer. So they do not give you a list of documents that you're supposed to produce. That keeps expanding. This is what a majority of people who have been harassed have pointed out. I filed a public interest litigation a couple of years ago with the help of senior counsel Prashant Bhushan on money that is lying unclaimed in dormant accounts. It's a huge amount of money with RBI, which is why the RBI central database has come up to at least help you track this money. The money that is frozen because of not having proper systems is huge. I have pointed out through RTI applications filed by Akash Goel that nearly one lakh crore or more continues to lie in inoperative accounts. This is mostly tax paid money belonging to us. I've already talked about IEPF. Now, what are the changes that are required? Everybody agrees. You heard the finance minister yesterday talking about how well India is doing, the number of middle class investors, at least the number of middle class Indians are at least 300 million. The rich are getting richer. They have a lot of wealth to leave in their wills. But we have a long way to go in ensuring smooth transmission and handover of assets to rightful legal heirs. So first of all, the will. Why the probate for three cities? It ought to be scrapped immediately. Second, even if you get a probate by spending time and money, it does not guarantee transmission. So here are a few examples that are based on what people have told us in the survey. In one case, the heirs took six years to get a probate. Once it was done, they submitted it to the bank and the bank decided that the will and the probate wasn't well construed, whatever that means, and that the banker would decide that assets would be distributed equally. There can't be a bigger illegality than this. But imagine the legal fight that will proceed from here. Another bank said it won't accept a will and refused to provide access to 32 lakhs to a widow, even though her daughters were going to provide an indemnity and a release. It insisted that the will should be probated. Now, we don't know whether she was in these three presidency towns 
or elsewhere, but it has happened and frankly was not required. This is just harassment. Common complaint is that officials dealing with transmission, whether it's in mutual funds, registrar and transfer agents or banks, not only do not have SOPs, they don't even understand transmission. They don't understand the difference between a will, a probate, a succession certificate, an RT, uh, airship certificate. So they demand whatever comes to their mind for their safety. Indemnities, sureties, witnesses, multiple affidavits, multiple NOCs, demand that people turn up in front of them and sign all kinds of things that come from lack of information, ignorance, lack of training. Who suffers? We. One officer sought KYC documents and Aadhaar of a deceased woman even after a death certificate was provided. Death ends everything. The municipality gives you a certificate. The banker has no business asking questions, but they did. This is about a woman who had a pension account in the same bank branch for many years, but they refused to recognize and wanted her KYC documents, if you please, only when they were threatened with legal action that the har harassment ended. One public sector bank manager asked a nominee to submit a statement of assets and liabilities to determine if he was worthy of access to a locker. Another public sector insurer refused to release death benefits to the nominee until the agent, who by now was untraceable, signed the documents. Finally, they arm twisted the heirs to buy new policies and then release the inheritance. This is pure blackmail. A registrar and transfer agent wanted indemnities and sureties despite submission of a registered will. Now, RTAs, there are innumerable complaints. I'm not going to go into them because I believe SEBI rules are new and hopefully would start working. If they are not and you're now facing it, please write to us because this is the time to fight for things. If you don't fight, nothing will change. Banks, like I said, offer multiple services. They, today you get your trading account, credit card, depository account, insurance, your fast tag, mutual funds, everything from a bank. All your relationships are linked to one unique customer ID. So a lot of people have been saying that if someone passes away, why not tell the nominee, not just the nomination on a particular account, but everything that's linked to this unique customer ID. It's simple, isn't it? It stops harassment of people. This is something we intend to push for through Money Life Foundation. If you agree, get, make your voice heard. Foreign nationals, of course, have the worst deal because they live abroad. Most of the time, their parents have left assets here. They are forced to make multiple trips. If they are in Mumbai, Calcutta, and Delhi, the whole rigmarole of going through the probate processes, that may also not help. People ask them indemnity, sureties, witnesses, come and sign before us, show us your face. It's difficult. Many of them just give up. If the money is a few lakhs, most of these people are earning a lot more abroad. They give it up and they should at least have the right to donate it to charity. Why should it go to the Consolidated Fund of India? After all, their parents have paid their taxes and their dues to the government. But this is how it is. Most of you don't even realize the unfairness of it. Now, Money Life Foundation survey has not even included property. That's a whole different ballgame, which I'm not going to talk about in this video blog. Maybe I'll do one later. What is clear, even from this narration, is that you need a holistic central process. Even the death registry ought to be central, not just by SEBI. Similarly, it shouldn't stop at this. People should have the right to make a living will, which is still not legal. There's a court case going on where you are able to say, do you want resuscitation, whether you want organ donation, whether you want to be put on life support or not. We do not have that right in India as yet, though we talk about Vikshit Bharat. There has to be a public outcry for better systems. Until then, this remains a low priority area. So you can do two things to make your voice heard. A, look at this link below or go to the Money Life website and please fill up this survey. If you have details, please put in those details. Second, subscribe to this video and share it because we, when I say public outcry, we need a lot more people making this demand. Thank you for listening.